Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Today, I'm joined by Sensei James Pankovich. We're this is this is this is our second effort here. We I've introduced you before. We'll probably we'll probably chat about that in a moment. But to the audience out there, if you want to support what we're doing, or you want to get the show notes, all the good stuff about what Sensei James is doing. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com is the place to go for that. You're going to find the show notes, all the details, all the things we talk about today will be over there. And if you want to support Whistlekick in general in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain, to get everyone in the world to train for at least six months, that's our stated mission here. Awesome. Go to Whistlekick.com. Check out everything we've got going on there. Well, so Sensei James, welcome back. It's... it's I, it's it's kind of funny, right? Because because we've done this part before, so I feel like I know you a little bit. But we yeah. we it, it was almost anticlimactic. We we had some internet troubles. Yeah, yes. we got kind of this far before, didn't we? And then yeah, uh, the uh, the gods of the internet decided it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I'm glad we're back. <laughs> I'm glad we are too. Thank you for your flexibility and, and your willingness to to oh, reschedule. See. Yeah, you know, it, it, it happens. And I, I think there's something very martial arts-esque about this approach, right? Because like our training doesn't always work out. We don't always get the training session we want, our testing, our competitions. Think, it, it's, it's not, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, think, I think it's good to be patient and uh, a little bit for forgiving sometimes. Right? Mm. <laughs> I think you have to be. Yeah. Right. Because there's only so much that we have control over. And Indeed. one thing we don't have control over is the internet. So true. <laughs> I was um, helping a friend last night with a very bizarre computer problem. It's what I used to do. And, and they said, can you help? And, and, and I said, yeah, it's going to be real quick. And, you know, of course, the real quick solution wasn't it. And an hour later, after doing 75 other things, the real quick solution worked that time. As I was running out of options. Yeah. <laughs> Par for the course. That's, yeah. that's, uh, I've had that experience so many times. If you're the yeah. one in the family that knows, you know, how to turn a computer on, you become the go-to guy. That's it, right? right? It's yeah. true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. Well, we're, we're here to talk about you. We're here to talk about martial arts. We're here to talk about your story. So let's start at the beginning of your story. If I said, you know, let's imagine there's a movie of your life as a martial artist. What's the first scene? Well, I grew up in a small town in, in the southwest of England. And um, uh, there was one karate dojo there uh, and a, a teacher there who, I, I, I didn't get to karate until I was about 17 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I did other kinds of sports. And then, you know, I, I left school at 18. That was the, the age back then. and. Um, and around that time, I sort of found karate and I found this dojo. And as it happened, the teacher there, who I'm still in contact with and, and mm. I have a huge amount of, of um, respect and gratitude for, the teacher there, Meek Sensei, had been to Japan. And he um, not only started teaching me karate, but he started telling me the stories of his visits to Japan. And um, I was hooked. Um, mm. You know, I was a small boy from a, a small town. And, um, you know, that sounded so exotic, so exciting and, yeah. and I just knew I had to get out there uh, and karate for me was more than just sort of another form of physical exercise um, it was sort of a gateway to into another culture mm -hmm. um, and um, and that really to be honest that's been the path that I've been pursuing is is trying to to, to learn more and travel more and, um, and martial arts for me has been it's been you know for all of us um, it gives you all kinds of benefits. Uh, and I love working out. I love training. I love sparring. I've done all kinds of competitions along the way and all kinds of things. Um, but um, the cultural aspect and the, and the way that martial arts has opened up a whole path through life for me is something which um, is just, um, you know, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for. And that's the main reason why I advocate to, to young people to pursue martial arts is because mm. of the doors that it opens to you in your life. Well said. Let's let's talk about that that first door for you because starting at seventeen, 
you know, over the years that, that we've been doing this show, that's not a common age. Ironically, it seems to be a more common age of the folks that we talk to. But anybody who owns a martial arts school will tell you 17 is not an age that most people start martial arts. They generally start earlier, they generally, or, or later. Yeah. What was your reason for starting? For me, it was actually, it was about learning uh, self-defense. Mm -hmm. um, I, like I say, I, I was in good shape at a lot of sports at school. I always been, enjoyed physical activity, um, but I wasn't, to be honest, kind of came from a family where martial arts was not encouraged. Mm -hmm. So it was, was also- Was it discouraged? Kind of yeah, it was sort of taboo. Oh, it was, it okay. was, you know, it was not something that, that was approved of. And um, so it was sort of something I hadn't been able to do until I got to the point where I was kind of get thinking about, you know, starting my own life. Uh, mm -hmm. I left home at about 18. It, it, um, if, if I may ask. Yeah. Yeah. Was, were, was the, the, the reason or the reasons it was discouraged, was it for accurate? understanding or inaccurate understanding um because of the belief that it was about violence okay you know, studying martial arts is about about in about practicing violence maybe perhaps yeah. even enjoying violence against other people so so a real misunderstanding of actually what martial arts practice is about as opposed to just going out and looking for a fight right, right. um and um but yeah um it was very strongly discouraged in my family um but of course, that made it even more exciting and uh, sort of mysterious for us. <laughs> yeah, t <laughs> tell, tell a 17-year-old they can't do something and that's all they're going to want. Exactly, exactly. It's the most basic reverse psychology, isn't it? <laughs> um, so um, for that, so that, that, was, that was one of the reasons. But then once I, start, once I walked into, and, I, and I, so I started doing a bit of kickboxing. Um, but once I walked into a more traditional dojo, and this was actually a Wadoryu Karate Dojo, um, I realized that there was a whole culture around this um, this exercise, and um, and like I say, that that really caught my interest. You know, there was a different language, there was um, different kind of etiquette, manners, um, and then there were all the stories about where this came from. You know, the other side, literally the other side of the world, uh, that very mysterious place which I already was intrigued by, but now I had almost a personal connection through this to my teacher there. Uh, and actually that turned out to be one of the first personal introductions that I benefited from to actually go later to go to, uh, to visit, uh, his sensei in Tokyo and, mm. uh, and train there. How old were you when you did that? That was, um, I was in my early twenties when I managed to do that. Yeah. Okay. It's a big deal, right? I, it's, yeah. you know, now because of social media, I, I think everyone feels like everyone who's been training for 20 years travels to the country of their martial art mm. origin. Uh, audience, that's not true, right? If, if you haven't been to Okinawa or Japan or China or Thailand, you know, don't, don't feel badly about yourself. But it is more common today than it was then. It's just so much easier these days. Um, yeah. And cheaper. <laughs> yes. Uh, you had to be very committed to want to do that. That had, you know, that, that in and of itself says something about your commitment to your training, your passion and where this fit into your life. I had to work out a way I had, they were, I was, you know, I'd come from a working class family. Um, we didn't have the money lying around to just fly around the world and go and live in another country for a few months. So I had to come up with a plan, a scheme. Mm. And what I did was, um, scheme. Decided I would study Japanese at university in the UK. Um, and as part of that, I went to Japan on exchange. Back in those days, university education was still heavily subsidized by the state back in the UK. And now it's a little bit different. So as a working class guy, lad, I was actually able to realize my dream by going to university, studying Japanese, which I loved as well, of course, um, and then um, getting to Japan that way. So that was my cool. my first route to, to Japan. Okay. And I imagine that you had expectations of what it would be like to be over there. Were, was I, it as you expected it? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, you know, okay. I'd, I'd watched everything and read everything I could about going about Japan, everything from, you know, the Shogun novels <laughs> and movies to, to modern day, you know, anime, manga, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I was expecting all kinds of things from the traditional 
to the hypermodern. And, and I found all those things. Um, but then there's lots of things that you don't expect. Um, so the nature of the people, the nature of Japanese people, very, very hospitable, um, very, very kind, um, very modest. Um, the, you know, just sort of everyday life is something you don't see perhaps quite so often. Now, these days you can find a YouTube video for anything, but, but back then you tend to, it tended to be more what had been in books and novels and movies. Mm. Um, so, so it was the everyday stuff, which, which, uh, was a real discovery for me. Mm. Um, I think that's what it's like when you go to any new country, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's the, it's the everyday interactions that, that, that really give you a feel for the, the true kind of nature of the place. And that's always my favorite when I travel yeah. to, to experience, you know, not, not, yeah, I, I like doing the touristy stuff, but you know, I want to go in the grocery store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to, I want to do some of the things that they do and, and experience their way of life, at least somewhat, not just, you know, what's it like to take my way of life and bring it here. Exactly. Exactly. And for me, language has always been important. So, um, Japan wasn't actually the first place where I lived abroad. When I was mm. 18, I, as I said, I sort of left home and I went and lived in Greece for two or three years. Um, and, um, why did I go there? Because it's, it seemed an exciting, fun place to yeah. go. Uh, and what a lot of history. There, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. And again, another place, a lot of history, um, but also, of course, a vibrant modern culture, lots of tourism. Mm -hmm. um, but learning the language there really helped me to unlock um, friendship there mm -hmm. and, um, and unlock learning about the culture from the locals. And so I really, really studied hard. <laughs> I actually went to Japan after only six months study, a language study. Truly. Um, but, Wow. But I was head down. I was head down every night, reading, writing, reading, writing, reading, writing, uh, and mm. speaking as much as possible. Uh, and so that, that for me was, was a real, was a real passion. I was, um, at, at a, I was a very boring first year university student, no parties, no going out. I was just study, study, study. I'm going to Japan. <laughs> the, the power of having a purpose. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or why I, we talk about why on the show a lot. Your, your why clearly I, I need to go to Japan and every, anything that's going to get in the way falls off. Absolutely. Yeah. That was 100%, 100% focused on that. And, um, and it, and it, it was everything that I expected and much more. Mm. Uh, and that, and that really began a path, which, you know, I'm pursuing today. Okay. So in exchange, so was that six months? Yeah. I, I exchange in my first year, I spent uh, the, the second half, the second six months in Hokkaido in the north of Japan. And then about two years later, in my third year, I got to spend another year, which turned into two years in Osaka in Japan. Okay. And talk about the end of that first period, that six months when you went back, <laughs> when you went back to the UK and, and, yeah, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing. If you went back for a year that turned into two years, I'm imagining there was some pain in leaving and you got back as soon as you could, but talk about that. I, I love living in Japan. I love being in Japan. Um, and I, I desperately wanted to go back. So I really was just counting, counting off the days, the weeks, the months until I could go back and visit again. Um, I, I, I went, went to university in London and, um, yeah, London's a vibrant city and, um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but, uh, yeah, Japan special. And, um, so I knew I had another chance to go, uh, probably in my second, third or fourth year. Uh, and I just, yeah, took every opportunity to make that happen. And, and thankfully it did. So mm -hmm. yeah, my time in London was great, but it's sort of, it's sort of a blur. I tend to remember my time in Japan more. <laughs> okay. And I imagine as you were spending time in Japan, you were training. Absolutely. I took every opportunity to train. Um, I was training every day. Uh, Wado, Wado Karate. Um, mm -hmm. I was, you know, as I was in Japan, my, my goal, as I'd gone there as a sort of a junior Q grade student was to take my, my first black belt test in Japan, Shodan. And then from there, you know, see how it goes. So I had this very firm, um, objective, uh, and then I ran karate, but then also while I was at university and they're living in big cities. There are lots of other dojos and martial arts. So I took every opportunity to train, uh, in other, um, disciplines too. So 
I would have done judo, kendo, jiu-jitsu, um, Western boxing, um, Nihon Kenpo, um, bits of sumo here and there, um, some kung fu. Um, so pretty much whatever I could do, I got a ch if I had a chance. And I was living a student life, so I had the time to do it too. Right? So. Okay. I'm trying to think of how, how to ask this question because sure. it's, it's a good question. It's how did training and those different things, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure some of those things got more of your time and attention than others, and some of those things were of more interest to you than others. But anytime we have someone on the show that is really kind of dabbled in a way that I'm sure plenty of the audience is saying, oh, I wish I could do that. You know, one of, one of my personal kind of long-term dreams is that we buy some old uh, shutdown university and make a true martial arts university where, you know, there are actual classes, you know, and you get yeah. an actual degree yeah. in something. Yeah. Uh, it's not a fully fleshed out idea because if I spend my time on that, it, it's going to be painful to not move forward with it yet. <laughs> I think you get it. Yeah. But how did how did all of that time and all of those different things impact your view on martial arts, your training in, in martial arts? And it, it sounds like, at least at the time, Wataru was was we could maybe call it your base art or your primary art. Yeah. And and how did those things impact your Wado training? Yeah, I always felt that karate was sort of my 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 mainstay. Um and I was really interested, but I realized that there were limitations in, in the karate system that I was studying. Wado is a great system. I really enjoyed it. I don't practice it anymore because there, there's no Wado practitioners here in, in Okinawa. But um, it's, a, it's a great system. And I liked it because it's a blend of uh, Okinawan karate and Japanese jiu-jitsu. Jiu and for me, the really interesting and kind of dynamic parts of that were where those two clearly intersected and sort of fused together. Mm -hmm. So, so Wado had sort of set me on a track to sort of, to, ex to explore at least those, those two branches of the tree, you know, the, the karate and the jujitsu, for example, in order to better understand the, the Wado that I was doing. Um, so I really looked at, at these opportunities to, to visit or to train for a while in other martial arts as complementary study. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I never, I never, I always felt karate was the, for me, the broadest. Uh, and then later when I arrived in Okinawa, I realized that actually how much broader and deeper it was than I had even seen until that point. Um, so for me, karate is a bit like a, um, you know, a Swiss, Swiss army knife, right? It can be, it can have lots of different ways, lots of different uh, tools in the tool, in the toolkit. Um, and it's, um, uh, and the skill sets overlap into what we would mm. look at as something you'd see in Aikido or something you'd see in Judo or something you'd see in striking arts, et cetera, et cetera. So karate was like the, 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 uh, the trunk. And I viewed all the other things as branches that intersected with it as in some way. So even if I didn't understand intersection yet, I was hoping that I would understand how those things intersected. And over the years, um, I have, um, found that to be very, very true. For me, um, it's um, karate is a broad church, um, but has a, a, um, a very actually a very wide, quite complete um, span. Um, mm -hmm. So today, I find no contradiction between between continuing to do mostly karate, but also learning other things as well, or just experiencing other things as well along the way. Yeah, I, I, I see it as a language or a philosophy, you know, you, you can train the same stuff as uh, someone who has a bunch of time as a karateka or someone who has a bunch of time as, as a, a Taekwondo practitioner. Mm. You can train the same things, but they're going to look different. It's a different philosophy it's a di or, or a different language. You know, one of the things I found uh, much to the chagrin of my Taekwondo instructor and, and others in that world, I spent most of my early days doing karate. And so I did Taekwondo as a karateka, whether I tried to or not. It's just, it's how I understood those sorts of movements in my body. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've met a lot of martial artists along the way so far. And um, when it comes to 
let's say, um, the actual execution of, of those skills, probably an aspiring environment, but sometimes, sometimes in a in an actual self-defense environment, but 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 even in an aspiring environment, what you tend to see is that is that there isn't that much difference between the skill set of someone that's come from karate and and applies that into a into a uh, a more free flowing sparring environment. I suppose someone that's come from another martial art like jujitsu, for example, or or even something as different as say kali or silat. Mm. Right? When you see people sparring, it becomes very very similar. What's interesting is is to look and see what is special to their skill set based on what the route they've come to learn to learn their martial arts. Right? For me, that's really really interesting. Um, but um, you know, the actual the solo practice of martial arts or the or the the kata based practice of martial arts becomes extremely distinctive. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of there's this, there's evolutionary pressures to make it very distinctive, right? So that it, so it doesn't just become the same as something else. Mm. But, but when you come to actually use it, it all tends to look very very similar. It does, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think it's a it's a functional thing. Sure, the the body only moves in so many ways. Exactly. And if somebody's trying to punch you in the face, there are only a handful of ways you can respond to that, that keep you from being punched in the face. Exactly, exactly right. Now, every now and again, someone pops up, who seems to be have a, a different way of doing things, right? Someone's got a really original take on things. Often, um, you know, there are a few individuals in every generation who are truly gifted, they just have sort of that mm -hmm. almost genius for, for martial arts. Um, and they push things in a new direction. And that's amazing, right? They have a massive effect on, on everybody's kind of approach. Um, so those sort of, um, and I, I you know I've, I've been uh, lucky enough to meet one or two individuals like that, um, along the way. And they are just, yeah, they're, you know, the sort of forces of nature. Right. Um, yeah. so, but again, yeah, as you say, they still have the same body, same two arms, two legs. Um, it's just what you do with it, which is kind of the, it's where the creativity and the originality is in, in what we do. Right? Yeah. Now, now, you know, if, if we are telling your story, if it is in the form of a movie, we've had some flash forwards and backs yeah. and everything, but you mentioned something that I think we need to start digging into, which is that you live on Okinawa. Yes. I, uh, I've been living on Okinawa for just over 15 years now. Um, my wife is Okinawa. I have three lovely daughters. Um, who were all growing up fast. Mm -hmm. um, I was in mainland Japan, um, finishing my degree. Uh, and um, I'd heard of Okinawa, but it wasn't really on my radar. I was very focused on being on the mainland and studying Wado Karate, mm -hmm. which is based on the mainland. But um, yeah, I met a girl from Okinawa and um, came down to just check out the island. Uh, and that was the beginning of a, of a relationship with Okinawa. So it wasn't actually karate specifically mm. that drew me down to the island, although I'd heard of it. Um, uh, but once I got here, uh, and I started to spend time and be introduced to a few people, it's a small place. So, you know, for example, my my mother in law, <laughs> yeah, was my mother in law already at that point. Um, she said, Oh, you, you like karate, right? She said, Oh, I used to work with a gentleman who's a karate teacher, I'll take you around to visit him. I said, fantastic. Turned out to be one of the most famous karate teachers in Okinawa. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he was lovely. Um, when I realized who I was meeting, because it didn't quite click straight away, but mm. then, you know, it sort of clicked. And I was like, oh my God, I've heard of this guy. He is very, very famous. Um, and he was a 10th Dan, already a 10th Dan teacher, uh, teacher at that point. Um, but he was incredibly kind and patient. My karate was, you know, nothing special certainly not in his scale of things. Um, but he was incredibly kind and patient. And, and that was one of the first experiences of training in a dojo in Okinawa. Um, uh, subsequently, I got to visit quite a few dojos before I did before I met who would become my, my main, main teacher in Okinawa. And I have to say that, that all of those experiences are very positive. Not all of them were something where I thought, Oh, that's a fantastic martial art, I want to do that. Mm. Some of them were just like, almost just like, um, you know, you find it's sort of a, it's like sifting through sand and you find a few diamonds here and there. 
So I, I took away something from every experience. Um, and then eventually, a few years down the line, um, I was in Okinawa and I met Arakaki Toshimitsu. Uh, and Arakaki Sensei uh, became my teacher for Matsubashi Karate uh, mm. and Kobudo uh, and remains my teacher and really my, my, uh, my uh, almost my, my sponsor yeah, in Okinawa to this day. Hmm. What was it about him or his teaching methods or his dojo that, because the way you just talked about it, it suggests that there was uh, not a short, I'm sorry, not a long decision process that you, you, you experienced this yeah. and said, that's it. That's what I want. So when I met him, I was very impressed by his character. Um, hmm. He was a real gentleman. Um, and um, as well as being very skillful, what he was doing, um, I'd at that point I trained in a, quite a few different dojos and quite a few mm -hmm. different arts by that point, and I'd had some good experiences and some not so good experiences. You know, the ones where you go, "That's an awesome guy," "That's an awesome teacher," or "Look how good that guy is at like literally like you know, knocking people down." I have to learn from him, despite the fact that they are not that person is not necessarily a very good person. Mm. They, you know, they have significant character, fl character flaws. Yeah. Um, but you go, no, you know, they've got the best technique. I need to learn that. What I learned over time was that those relationships don't last because if you can't maintain respect for somebody, you can't really maintain the desire to learn from them. Um, by contrast, when I met Arakaki Sensei, um, I just was very impressed by his character. Um, and, um, just wanted to spend more time with him. Uh, and that, mm. that's, that continues to be the, um, that today he is, he is a, a, a wonderful friend and mentor as well as being, you know, my, um, obviously my, my karate instructor. How did he feel about taking you as a student, you know, as, <laughs> as a Westerner, Westerner who he had not started from the beginning, who had, you know, fairly recently moved to the island, and, I, and I'm sure that the instructors on Okinawa are constantly bombarded by Westerners coming in with something that yeah. might not land well in their culture, uh, yeah. marrying a local and having all these other experiences in the martial yeah. arts that maybe he had to unteach. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't the first Westerner that he'd had in his dojo or that he taught. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think I was the first for a while who looked like I was going to stay. Mm. So this was not my first time in Japan. I'd already, and so I was pretty, pretty sure that I wanted to stay in Okinawa and live in Okinawa by that point. Um, so there was that. I also, I said to him, look, I was very honest with him. I said, you know, I, I've, I've studied this and this and this along the way I've been training, you know, by the time I met him, I've been training for 20 years. Um, um, but I said to him, you know, but I'm, you know, I want to, my mindset will be to keep my, my, my cup empty or as empty as possible and try and allow any, everything to come into it. So he said to me, fine. He said, you know, you're going to wear a white belt. You're going to start from the beginning in our system. I was, I was absolutely fine with that. So yes, love to do that. Um, and we took it from there and, um, I, you know, I really focused on listening more um, and um, just, just you know, enjoying his teaching. Uh, it, it was a small dojo, so I got a lot of, you know, one-to-one -one time with him. And um, what, What's considered a small dojo in Okinawa? <laughs> about five to ten people training regularly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, his dojo is actually in his house. So um, he, he has a custom-built dojo on the ground floor of his of his house it's a small dojo i mean um you know the, the saying about swinging cats yeah <laughs> um you could probably swing about two cats in that dojo <laughs> um, so does he have a a, a day job or no, were all five paying. to ten of you paying okay he, he was already retired by the time that i met him he's now in his 80s oh, okay. um, and still going strong still in great shape cool. um, but yeah he pretty much retired um, he'd done well in life. He was obviously quite well off and he was retired and enjoying teaching karate. Um, so I kind of met him at a, at a good time in that mm. he was still in very good shape. Um, 
and um, was just enjoying his karate. So, um, and we spent a lot of time not only training, but just talking, you know, he'd teach me all kinds of things about the history of the island, about uh, Okinawan culture, about Okinawan language, um, phrases uh, that they were used in the dojo, uh, as well as introducing me to other people that he thought would be useful, interesting, or, you know, good friends as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, he's, he's been a real mentor, not just for the karate itself, but for uh, sort of an introduction to Okinawa and Okinawan culture too. Mm. Okay. And I would imagine in putting on a white belt, uh, just the way you're coming across, you worked really hard to empty your cup and to keep it, keep it empty, <laughs> as empty as possible as someone can with 20 years of training. Well, yeah, mm. I mean, to be honest, I still didn't feel um, I, you know, after 20 years of training, a lot of people perhaps will have opened their own dojo or got to the stage where they're sort of, they've gone into more of the teaching mode. Sure. I wasn't there. I wasn't anywhere near that. Um, and, um, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in, um, you know, being the teacher. I just mm -hmm. wanted to learn. And so, and it wasn't until. Well, I only opened my dojo about six years ago, um, and that felt felt like the right time. Hmm. So why? Back, um, because the more people I met who were very capable in what they were doing, the more I realised how much I didn't know, um, and that there was a skill level, a skill level. I wanted to say what I regard as my as the minimum minimum skill level hmm. kept going up. <laughs> so, um, I suppose, uh, you know, it, um, what's, what's the, um, the imposter syndrome, right? The yeah. idea that you're, you're never quite good enough to be doing what, what, what other people think you should be doing. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually a very healthy thing in many ways. Um, and for me, when I arrived in Okinawa, and I started to, to go around and visit all these different dojos, I started to realize how much I didn't know. Um, and so I was not um, overly enthusiastic to be standing up going, hey, I'm a teacher here now, you need to come and start learning from me. You know, I felt that there was a long way to go. Um, so uh, yeah, that took some time. Hmm. Did you feel some pressure given that you were a Westerner living in Okinawa? teaching something that let, let's face it came out of their region and not where you were from yeah absolutely um and um and even today i don't i i see myself as um passing on a tr tradition so um when i think about uh sensei the word sensei in japanese you know it means literally someone that's just ahead of you on the path so there will always be people, people ahead of you on the path and people that will be coming up behind you. And I think um, the fair thing to do is to be as kind and generous to people that come up behind you as you've received from the people that are in front of you. Um, so for me, Sensei is sort of that, that, that um, ongoing process of learning and then sharing, learning and sharing, learning and sharing. Um, so I look at it that way and therefore um, I don't think that it's a pedestal of any kind. I don't think it's where you, you go like, you know, I'm here, I've achieved this. Um, you know, no, I think it's an ongoing process. Uh, my dojo um, is for me, um, it's not the, it's not the James Pankovich show. Um, it's for me, it's a place where we meet, we get together and we train. And so um, my dojo actually therefore is, is, it's sort of has a, a unique flavor in Okinawa in that obviously, of course, it's a foreign, foreigner run dojo. So that's unusual. I'm not the only one. I'm not the first one in Okinawa, um, but it's, but it's unusual. Um, and then the other thing that's unusual is that I've encouraged other teachers to come and teach in my dojo as well. So mm. I teach what I've learned, which is primarily Shorin Ryu Karate, Matsubashi Ryu Karate and Kobudo. Uh, I then have uh, other teachers that teach Goji Ryu in the dojo. Uh, and other teachers that teach motoburu, which is another old style of Okinawan martial arts. And for me, that's fantastic. 
Uh, yeah. But it's very unusual in Okinawa for there to be more than one style in a dojo. Hmm. How, how is that viewed? Given that it's different and you're a foreigner doing the different thing. Well, I'm always going to be a foreigner doing different things. So sure. I've, I realized a while back that if you want to stay in Japan as a foreigner, you have to accept that you're never going to be a local. So, um, in a way it's, it can be frustrating, but, um, it also gives you a sort of a, a space that has a certain freedom, um, that is unique to being a foreigner in a foreign culture. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a unique, not, not unique. It, it's, it's a kind of special position. There are one or two other individuals in the island, um, who I have a great respect for, who also followed the same path. Some of them before me in terms of arriving here, deciding this was going to be their home and then, um, becoming part of that martial arts tradition. Um, uh, and more are coming. Okinawa seems to be becoming more popular, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, th I think it's, uh, I think there's, there's a phrase, there's a phrase in, in Okinawa karate about keeping a beginner's heart. Uh, I think this is, this is more widely known as well. So the idea is that, is that you should always keep that sense of sense of sort of modesty and humility and almost a sense of wonder that you have when you're a beginner at something. Mm. Um, and I always try to remember that it was actually a favorite phrase of my teacher's teacher. So Arakaki sensei's teacher, who was Nagamini Shoshin. Nagamini Shoshin founded Matsubashiru, the style that we do today. Um, and while I never got to meet him in person, I was just too late to arrive on the island mm. before he passed away. Um, Arakaki sensei shares a lot of his experiences from Nagamini sensei. And, um, that's one of the sort of the pearls of wisdom that, that comes down. Mm. Cool. And is, is the dojo your full-time gig or do you do other things on the island? Uh, it is now. Yeah. Um, uh, up until 2020, I was running a place called the dojo bar, uh, which was a karate themed, uh, bar, <laughs> mm. uh, pub, uh, in Naha. Uh, and what became a very popular meeting point for um, karateka, for martial artists visiting Okinawa, as well as as well as well sort of foreign visitors in general. Um, I did that for nine years. Um, mm. uh, and then due to Corona and the whole shutdown, uh, I closed the place in 2020. Um, the, the upside of that was that it enabled me to focus on running my dojo, which I'm enjoying immensely. Um, and um, during Corona, when we didn't have too many tourists coming or almost none at all, um, I also managed to realize uh, another project that I had on, the, had on the back burner for several years, which is uh, Bujin TV, hence the banner behind me. Mm. Um, I'm making a shameless plug here. Um, no, no, so, no shamelessness <laughs> to it. Plug, plug away, my friend. <laughs> so Bujin.tv uh, is an online um, martial arts video website. So over the years um, in Okinawa, I had, along with a good friend of mine called Chris Wilson, who is a British photographer and videographer, over the, the 10 years before um, we got to here, we'd been doing interviews uh, with Okinawan karate teachers. And we'd amassed quite an archive. Um, some of it had been shared online. Um, and also I knew that there were a lot of other great videos that I'd like to get of Okinawan teachers. Mm -hmm. And so, Bujin TV was sort of the idea was that this would be a place where all of that content would be made available without, you know, uh, annoying advertising, whatever else, it would be a place that were dedicated to really high quality martial arts content. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what Bujin TV is, um, today, today, um, the content is actually much wider than just coming from Okinawa, although we retain a lot of exclusive content. Um, and so. Um, Bujin TV, um, working with content partners, updating that, sharing that is sort of about a third of what I do. Um, a third is my dojo. And now post Corona, a third is actually helping people who are visiting the island to maximize their visits here, principally martial artists. So I sometimes take people on tours, history tours. Okay. Cool. 
Yeah. You're, um, you're a you're a martial arts tour guide to Okinawa. <laughs> is, is that is that a, a, a oversimplified version of what you do? Uh, there's quite a demand for that. I do do that. Quite That's frequently. amazing. Yeah. Um, and there's so much fascinating stuff to go and see that um, yeah. that um, that never gets uh, stale. And then the other thing I do is I will support and facilitate large events here. So, for example, international mm -hmm. seminar events. Um, so just this year, this year has been so busy. The bounce back um, after in the country reopening after mm. after Corona is just hear. crazy. Um, so we've had some big events here this year, hundreds of people. Uh, and um, I, you know, project manage those, help to, 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 to make sure that those get, um, get, you know, an appropriate venue and, and teachers and marketing and all that stuff too. So yeah, it's been a busy year, actually. <laughs> Sounds it. Oh, that's great. Okay. And when you, you consider these three things, do you see them as parts of a whole? Or are they distinct in your mind? Oh, they're very much connected. Yeah, they're very much connected. I mean, uh, you know, if you're into Venn diagrams, or things like that. I am. A huge, very much so. <laughs> there's a huge overlap in the middle. The overlap is knowledge and passion for you know authentic martial arts um so all of those things that i do would be rendered kind of fake uh without it being connected to a sort of a truth which is a you know a real passion for um understanding uh and passing on the the martial arts knowledge um mm. which is here in okinawa but which because okinawa is sort of a crossroads because it attracts so many people that are here with a like you know like-minded people with the same kind of mindset. Um, they also bring lots of other things with them too. They're also people that have trained in lots of lots of different things. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example. Just just last month, I had a wonderful month. A friend of mine um, who is a Maori um, martial artist mm -hmm. came up from New Zealand. Um, and uh, my friend Tuari, his name's Tuari, he also teaches Maori martial arts, the traditional weapons arts of the, of the Maori people. Oh. But he's also- That's so cool. He's also a lifelong um, karateka and kabudaka. So, oh, we, we gotta get have, him on the show. Oh, he, he is an awesome individual, and I highly yeah. recommend we do that. Yeah, um, he um, for him it was a dream coming to Okinawa for a month and staying and having that time to you know go and do all kinds of things that he wanted to do in the mm. past. It wasn't the first time he'd been to the island, um, but in previous times he'd sort of been chaperoned along with the group. They'd come, they trained, they'd left. Um, so. For him, it was sort of a dream come true. Um, and um, we just had some awesome sessions, basically um, training karate, training Okinawa Kobudo, and then training Maori martial arts. And for me, it was just the absolute you know, personification of um, what I love to realize here, which is bringing people together like that. Um, and um, yeah, that's why I love living here, because it's a, it's a crossroads. Um, uh, historically, it's always been that way. It's, you know, the reason Okinawa has been so significant is because of literally where it is in between, you know, Asia, mm. Japan, Southeast Asia. And these days, of course, people come in from all around the world. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a fantastic place to be. Hmm. Why shouldn't someone come to Okinawa? Why should is there a type? <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there, are there certain expectations that people might have? Uh, <laughs> that when they get there, they realize, oh, this is not it. I think this rarely happens, but I've seen it a couple of times, is um, people come to Okinawa to show off how good they are. <laughs> <laughs> it does and, not seem like a good idea. Well, they might be really good. I mean, to be honest, these days, um, you know, there are some fantastic martial artists all around the world. Of so they might be really good, but that's not the point. If you come to Okinawa, it seems like such a waste of opportunity to spend all your time trying to show off what you've got rather than looking for opportunities to find out something new or to learn something new. Um, if you're really, really, really good already, like I said before, it's kind of like sifting through sand and you'll find the odd diamond or two, but it's worth it. You know, it's worth sifting through that stuff to find those gemstones, right? And um, so it, it happens rarely, but now and again, um, I've come across somebody who 
just missed all kinds of opportunities because they weren't, you know, they were too full. You know, mm -hmm. the glass was full. Um, so um, I'm glad you brought it back to that. Yeah, because I, I think it's such an important philosophy on the show. We talk about it often as keeping a white belt mentality. Yeah, absolutely. I just you know, when do you learn the fastest? When you start, when you are a white belt, when you assume exactly. that you know nothing, exactly. and the longer you can keep that, the faster and better you progress. Exactly. Um, listen more than you than you speak. Um, be open to new ideas. Um, you don't have to agree with everybody, but you know, listen. And, and you know, try and try and learn as much as you can. I think it's the the best way to be. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, so sometimes what you learn is this is not the way for me. But the better you understand it, it still has value. It's very very true. Very, or very true. as my instructors drilled into us when I was a child, you never know if someone that you're going to teach needs that. So while it might not be part of your you know, the common toolbox you work with, you really should have it in the archive if you need to pull it out for them later. That's a very good point is that you, you don't, you can't measure the impact of what you do immediately. It's really nice to get immediate feedback, of course. I mean, that's, that's really, really useful, but, but it's a lot for many people, hopefully, um, it's something that we say benefit from over the long term as well. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm still relatively young at this whole thing, um, but um, already, uh, you know, it, it's good sometimes to see a few years down the road that people have really benefited from an experience that you've been part of. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know yourself that that's always been the case for you too, you know. Um, so I remember, you know, right back to, as I mentioned, my first karate instructor back there in the UK um, and the seeds that he he um, um, so to me um, continue to to sort of blossom in a way. Um, so um, uh, and then so many so many acts of kindness uh, along the way. People sharing and teaching where they didn't need to. They weren't being paid for it necessarily. Um, those are the things which often stick in your mind. Uh, and it's not just the thing you got taught. It was also the way that you were you were. Um, treated as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that word sharing as a substitute for teaching. Yeah. I can I can teach you something, but it's really up to you to decide to learn it, right? And, and vice versa. Yeah. You can't make someone learn. They have yeah. to they have to choose to internalize it. So yeah. um, that's why I prefer share. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I teach kids now. I, at my dojo, mm -hmm. we have regular kids classes four times a week. Um, so I have a course. We have about 20 to 25 junior students on our books, which I know, I know is not a big group in, uh, compared to many dojos, but um, so that's a really interesting process. Um, there's sometimes there's a language challenge um, here and there, but actually it's more about trying to understand how best to have the kids take something away from it as opposed to just being somewhere where they came and spent some time, you know, an after school club, for example. Um, and it is an after school club for them. So I, sh I don't forget that, but I'm always trying to think about ways in which for each of them to make it something which is they care about, you know, rather than just a, just a passing the time kind of thing. And I don't know if, how I do you do that? Well, I don't know if I always achieve it, but, but, um, you know, try and find ways to, to help them feel that they are part of what's happening. They're engaged in it, that they are particip they are participating and not just there sort of watching it and waiting for the time to go past. Um, you know, giving them a sense of achievement, um, giving them a sense of a purpose. So it's different, you know. I, I think in Okinawa, I'm told that uh, the kids in Okinawa are very well behaved compared to maybe some other places. Um, I haven't taught kids in other countries, so I don't know. Um, so on the one hand, it's probably in some ways they're they're an easier crowd, perhaps in other places. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I didn't, you know, you don't know though. You don't know. I mean, most my dojo has only been open for about six years now, so I don't know yet. You know how much and how far 
you know, they'll take that with them. But I hope, I hope it's, it's something that they will, um, will benefit them in their lives. Is the kids program newer? I got the no. sense you didn't start that at the beginning. Uh, no, no, we started when we opened the dojo. We opened the dojo okay. in, uh, it was right at the end of 2018. Uh, so yeah, yeah, five years, six years. Um, and yeah, we started with the kids and the adults at the same time. And it really okay. was a steep learning curve. Um, <laughs> if to, to anybody out there who's never taught children, even if you've uh, if you've had children, right, to have one child or two child children, four, maybe you have a really big family, you have six. Yeah, it's a completely different dynamic to have six of your own children versus five, ten, twenty yeah. of not your children that exactly. you are trying to not only keep from tearing things apart, but to impart knowledge to them. Uh, talk, talk to a public educator. They, yeah. they will tell you the same thing. If, yeah. if you can do that, working with adults is a dream. I think um, teaching in itself is obviously a skill. You know, people go to university and study for years to become good at that, to, to acquire that skill uh, and, the, and the, um, the tool set that goes with that. Um, yeah. And I think that should not be underestimated at all. Um, even while you might think you know karate or be good at karate yourself, you know, physically be able, able to do it. Teaching, teaching anything is a skill set in itself. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I've invested in is, is, is that is trying to become a better teacher over the past few years. Um, mm. I have to say that opening my dojo, my objective was not to become, um, a, um, professional teacher. Um, but I feel like it's become a very important skill set. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. so yeah, that's something that that's that I invest in now too, in terms of you know, researching, looking for better ways um, to and more relevant knowledge and understanding um, to be a, a better, I suppose, a better communicator mm -hmm. as well. I mean, I think good teachers are very good communicators. They they're probably um, good at listening and understanding people, and they're good at, at being able to connect with people. Um, yeah. So I think that's what I try to do better, but it's very much yeah. a work in progress. <laughs> I, I've, I've had the, the honor of, you know, one of the things that we do at Whistlekick, we have a teacher training and certification division. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I work on and in mm -hmm. with some other folks. And yeah, I think it comes down to really two things. It's empathy. Mm -hmm. Cause if, if people don't, know that you care if they don't care about you it's really hard to do anything Absolutely. and then it's communication on top of that yeah. and if you can connect with someone and then you can communicate appropriately right not too much not too little in it in in the way that they needed it it, it it really does come down to those two things but those two things are not easy they're simple they're not easy to do and it Absolutely. does take a tremendous amount of time i say it does um sometimes you can try uh, i've one thing i've realized is sometimes you can be trying too hard to teach yeah. um, sometimes you need to give people space just to go and practice and sort of figure things out for themselves so while it's easy you know when people come to the dojo you want to give them sort of you know value for money so to speak right okay you've come for 90 minutes of instruction i'm going to give you 90 minutes of instruction well actually actually often what works better is you give them a little something to, to think about and then give them some space to go and practice that and work on that for yeah. themselves. So I, I would so. say not 90 minutes of instruction, but 90 minutes of education, <laughs> exactly. because those two things are dramatically different. Indeed. Exactly. So yeah, sometimes you can feel like, um, you know, you're trying very hard to be an instructor, but actually you're actually not doing a great job of, of actually helping that person learn. Um, okay. So like I say, it's a work in progress uh, for me. <laughs> it's a work in progress for all of us, or at least yeah. it should be. So what's next? If we look down the line, we look into the future crystal ball, mm. you know, we revisit in five, 10 years and I say, Hey, what's, what's happened since? What would you hope we, you were saying? Well, I, I'm very invested in, in my dojo. My dojo is called Asato Dojo. Uh, it's the name of the dojo, Asato Dojo, A-S-A-T-O. Um, and uh, I'm very invested in my dojo. So I hope that my dojo, 
um, continues to be a place where um, we welcome all comers, people that want to come and visit, um, and it continues to be a gateway to learning in Okinawa. Um, uh, the dojo is becoming a little better known now. Um, one of the things that I have started to do is to go uh, overseas and teach. Um, so I suspect that over the next few years, I shall be traveling a little more regularly to go and teach, which is, um, again, a, uh, an interesting new challenge, which uh, I'm sort of growing into. Um, I really hope that Bujin TV continues to grow um, as a, uh, an online destination for people that want to come and you know, find great quality content, uh, authentic yeah. martial arts content. Um, and, um, well, we have, we have some other events. Um, uh, we, we didn't talk about the 100 kata event yet, but, um, tell, tell, tell us about that. <laughs> so, um, it's now, it's now a 10 year old tradition. Um, we just celebrated our 10th year here in Okinawa, um, doing our 100 kata challenge in the shadow of Shuri castle, which is the, mm. the, 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 um, the capital, uh, city castle here, the old castle here. Um, so the 100 Kata Challenge is a celebration of Karate Day, which in Okinawa is on October the 25th every year. Um, and um, there are local celebrations here. Everybody gets together. They do karate together. They do, do kata demonstrations on the, on the main street in the city. Um, the 100 Kata Challenge is a way to extend that celebration wider. So what we mm -hmm. do is we invite everybody to take on that challenge of performing 100 Kata in sequence on Karate Day, or as near to Karate Day as they can. So October the 25th every year, uh, and uh, it's been growing and growing. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a challenging participatory event, um, uh, open to everybody, all ages, all, all, all um, levels of skill and ability. Uh, and this year, uh, and we have an online um, kind of reg registration for it. This year we had, uh, I think, I think we had, we had a, uh, about 150 registrations, and then those most of those were dojos around the world, uh, probably in 40, 40 different countries, um, and um, which amounts to thousands and thousands of people around the world yeah. taking part. Awesome. And for me, that's that's just so heartwarming. In that, um, it, if it does two things, it brings people together and, and and doing their karate practice in their local communities and enjoying it. Typically, they're outside mm -hmm. in the park, on the beach, whatever, doing it. Another thing is it is it reminds me of the connection back to here, back to Okinawa, um, and uh, I think those those two things are really really important, and really relevant. So, um, yeah. so I hope the two Kata... two of our three mission statement, right? Connect, educate, entertain. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There is some education that goes there, but it's you know, the connection is is there in several ways. The enter entertainment is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, that, powerful that's, experience. That's the thing. I think one of the things that I've realized. Um, one of the one of the things that karate does really well is it does connect people to, together. It's not the case for all martial arts, um, but karate just I think because of the way it's evolved and where it's come from, what it's become, is I think one of the most social martial arts you'll ever come across. Mm -hmm. um, it really does act as a sort of a common language between people. I've noticed mm -hmm. here uh, when I was running the dojo bar and, and subsequently now with my dojo is that. Even if there, there are literally language barriers between people, if they can get together and train in karate, then they feel very much connected to each other. Um, that sort of mutual love of, of their martial arts practice. Um, that's a really powerful thing. It's an important thing. Um, and um, so I really hope that we continue to foster that and find opportunities to, to encourage people to connect with each other, uh, learn from each other, practice alongside each other. I hope so too. And speaking of connection, if people want to connect with you, website, social media, email, any of those things that you want to share with the folks. Absolutely. Um, so asatodojo.com is um, our website um, online front page. And a lot of what we do is linked uh, from there. Uh, Bujin.tv, uh, please come and check it out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, find us on Facebook, uh, mostly Facebook these days, a little bit of Instagram. I steer clear of Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, either my name, James Pankovic or Sato Doja, um, and you should be able to find, find, uh, 
uh, find me, find what we do quite quite easily. Um, and um, if anybody is, is um, wants to come to Okinawa um, and um, wants to find out more, please get in touch. I'm happy to help. I do it every day. I help people every day with mm. sometimes just questions, advice, sometimes with more concrete um, arrangements to help people come to Okinawa and really maximize their time here. So by all means, get in touch. Sounds great. And I'm, I'm going to have you close up for us in a moment and then I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of an outro. So how do you want to leave things with people today? What are your words that you want to go out on? Um, I want to encourage people, encourage people. Um, I'm guessing people that are watching this are probably already practicing martial arts and I'm going to encourage you. Most to, of them. Yeah. I want to encourage you to continue, continue, do what you can do. Okay. My sensei, my 80 year old Okinawan karate sensei, who is still going strong, both in body, spirit, um, mind. Um, he says a little bit every day, do what you can do, keep training. Um, and, um, and connect with people. Connect with people. Use your training to connect with people. It's important. Um, uh, so, um, and look for ways to, to, you know, to improve yourself. There's always a way that you can improve yourself. Um, whatever kind of challenges you're facing, there are ways in which you can improve yourself. Look for those and, and try to realize them. Um, um, I think karate is an amazing, an amazing tool for doing all of those things. Uh, so if you're not doing karate, and that and that those things sound attractive, then I encourage you to give it a try. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here. I appreciate your time. Audience, you know what to do. Go check out everything that we've got going on. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the best version of the show notes with all the great links and everything. And if you want to support us, whistlekick.com. Anything that you find over there that is of interest, whether it's sharing things with people or picking something up with the code podcast15, it helps us do what we do, and we appreciate you sticking around, if nothing else. So I think we'll call it there. It's been a great I'm pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on.